Thank you. All right. Good morning, Escarzon. Good to see you. Morning. Can you hear us okay, Escarzon? You're muted there, brother. Can you hear us? Uh, good, good morning, Pastor Tim. Ah. Yes, I can hear you. Pastor. Very good. Pastor Michael, good morning. Hey, it's out, Nick. Good morning. Good morning. Good to see you. Okay, well, this week we have something special. I know you've, you've been waiting for a long time to be uh, <laughs> finished with narrative analysis, <laughs> to, to do something different. Um, and today we're going to do some review of of the uh, structural diagramming because the structural diagram if you remember is sort of the the visual way to help us see how phrases and sentences are connected together um, grammatically as, uh, in particular and so per, especially in epistles it's a very helpful tool for us to see how how those phrases are linked together and because epistles are are instructive in nature um, exhortational, uh, they give instruction. So usually the sentences are connected together very logically and the, looking at the grammar helps. Um, even poetic passages, uh, diagramming can be very helpful because poetry, as we will see in the next module, uh, does have its own unique characteristics, but uh, it also uses uh, rules of grammar. And so uh, diagramming will help in that. Now with narratives, Diagramming is a little different, all right? Because we're looking at a story. And again, here's the steps that we're using for looking at a uh, passage. So I just wanted to throw out the question, uh, what value does diagramming have in narrative passages? Again, remember, narratives aren't like epistles. So it's not like a, each phrase, each sentence uh, is connected to one another and is communicating instruction or doctrinal truth. In a narrative, the doctrinal truth will often just be found in the, in the point of the story. And that not every scene and every part of a scene has some doctrinal truth connected to it. Uh, very often in stories, that doctrinal truth is the, the point of the story. It's, the, it's the, the plot, as the plot reveals the point of the story. Uh, so the question comes up is what what value then might might um, uh, diagramming a narrative have right, and what and what parts of a narrative may present opportunity for diagramming to be useful um, so what i 'd like to do is is sort of express to you some of the um, potential values for diagramming in narratives. Now, when we diagram in narrative, we don't diagram the whole narrative. Because if it's like, and Jesus said this, and the woman at the well said this, and then he said, and then she said, that diagramming won't, won't be very helpful at all. But sometimes, within the, the statements that are made in the narrative, it can be very helpful to diagram those statements. For example, when Jesus is speaking in John 4 of the true worship, if you remember that discussion he had and he shared some principles about true worship. Now that part of the narrative is very instructional. And so that part of the narrative would be very useful to diagram, especially if you're planning on explaining that within the course of your sermon. Uh, because there, the genre sort of, sort of changes. Yes, the overall genre or type of literature in the narrative is a story, but within the story, there's often instructional parts where Jesus will give a, a command or some instruction, or as in the case of, of his dialogue with the woman at the well, he gave her instruction regarding living water. He gave her instruction regarding uh, true worship. When he was speaking with the disciples, he gave them instruction regarding them being sent. And so those parts of the narrative actually uh, can be very useful to diagram, again, because the style is more like a, a, a sermon. It's more instructional rather than storytelling. Does that make sense? Does that, uh, and this is what is interesting about biblical literature is it's not just 
you usually don't just have one genre or one type of literature. There's often a mixture. Uh, even within, you know, within uh, Old Testament narrative, sometimes you'll have a poem thrown in there that you'll need to study as a poem. Or in uh, various narratives, you'll have instructional parts. For example, in Matthew chapter 5 to 7, the Sermon on the Mount, that's a sermon. And so you're not going to approach that sermon like you would a story, even though the sermon is found within a story. So that what Jesus says in that sermon, you're going to look at that more like you would look at an epistle, because the sermon is more of instruction, exhortation, commands. But you study Matthew as a whole, you're going to study it like a narrative. But certain parts of Matthew, you will study uh, more like an epistle because it's, like I said, uh, Jesus giving teaching or instruction. And we have that here in John chapter 4, where there are certain places within this narrative where Jesus is offering specific instruction. And so those would be places that would be uh, useful uh, to diagram. Uh, so for example, uh, what portions of John, if, as we look at the story, and let me see if uh, I think you guys can remember the story basically, we won't read it yet, but in John 4, 13 and 14, that was a dialogue with the woman uh, about the living water. Or in John 4, uh, verses, I think, 21 to 24, it's a dialogue, um, dialogue about true worship. Okay, so those would be places, those would be verses that would be helpful to, to diagram so that we could break down exactly what Jesus was saying. Okay, are there any comments or questions on that before, before we move on to the next step? What I was saying about having parts within a narrative that you would look at more like an epistle when you're studying it. Does that, did that make sense? Are there any questions about that? Okay, it's clear? Okay. Okay, good. Like I said, there's other examples. Uh, for example, the book of Jonah, which you guys, uh, some of you have as your preaching text. Uh, within Jonah, there's a poem. And so I didn't, I didn't assign Jonah chapter 2 to anybody because Jonah 2 you would have to study the, as poetry, not as narrative, even though that poem is within a narrative. And so what's interesting is you're looking at the book of Jonah, you would need to understand how does Jonah 2, this poem, fit within the story? You'd need to answer that question. But when you're examining Jonah chapter 2 itself, you'd have to study it as a poem because it, it's given really as a psalm. And so... Uh, like I said, there's many examples of sort of this mixed genre. When you're studying uh, many parts of the Old Testament, the Pentateuch, there are certain passages which are narrative, and then you have law passages found within that narrative. And you would need to approach those law passages a little bit differently in some ways. All right? Um, and so, and, like, and for example, in uh, the Gospels, in the narratives, you'll often have parables which are sort of a sub-narrative, a certain kind of narrative that you have to study a certain way uh, that's slightly different than a narrative overall. Uh, many times in prophetic literature, you'll have, you'll have poetry that you need to understand. Some, some prophetic literature is given in the, in the context of a story, so you need to understand the story and, and how this prophecy fits within the story. Um, and so we see a lot of that type of genre mixing in, in scripture. And we have to be sensitive to that because when we're studying that portion, we have to identify, okay, am I looking at a narrative in this part of scripture? Am I looking at a poem? Am I looking at uh, wisdom literature? Am I looking at uh, uh, more of like an epistle or sermonic instructional literature? Um, so again, am I looking at law text? All of these are things we need to, to take into account as we approach that particular part. So all that to say is there are pl places where diagramming can be useful and helpful within narrative, but I wouldn't diagram the whole narrative, only certain parts. But if I'm studying an epistle, I diagram the whole passage. Or if I'm studying a poem, I'll diagram the whole poem. All right? 
But for narrative, we just are selective to those parts of the narrative which are instructional, okay? All right, any questions? Pastor good morning, Bobby. Brother Arn. It's good to see you. Yeah, Pastor Bobby. Uh, when you say diagramming, okay, um, what, what do you mean? Could you elaborate a little more? No. When does diagram what is your context of diagramming in the whole structure of because because what I'm getting is uh, that diagramming according to your explanation is uh, the structure the flow of the uh, story we are looking at okay so do you mean diagram the whole flow a aside from diagramming particular uh, scenes or particular uh, portions okay. how, how would you relate to that pastor Tim? yeah when i use the term uh, structural or block diagramming what i'm referring to is if you'll remember, um, um, let's see. So if you remember uh, that we covered this in module one, where, uh, for example, I might say I hit the ball over the fence. I hit the ball um, with my bat over the fence. And so we said, how do, we're trying to connect how do these phrases relate to one another. And so we, with a diagram, you would, you would have, you would basically show how these phrases relate by indenting them under the word they modify. So for example, I hit the ball is the main sentence. You have the subject, you have the verb hit, and you have the object. What was oh, hit so the he, ball? Yeah. Uh, can you please uh, display the... So oh, I'm sorry. Know. <laughs> yeah. I apologize for that. I thought I was. Thank you, Pastor Michael. Let me try this again. All right. Let's see. Whoops. I gave you the wrong one. Wrong file. It is this one. Okay. Pastor right. Tim? Yes. Huh. Can we record also? Can it's we ask recorded. for a minute to record? Oh, if you want to, go ahead. I'm, I'm recording as well. So okay. each week I've been posting that on the uh, Facebook message group. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. And if you go to the, my YouTube page, you'll see I have all of our lectures, all of our sessions, um, all 12 of them online. Okay. It's not well organized yet, but you can find it there. But you're welcome to record as well. If you would like. Um, so uh, this is what I was thought. I thought you guys saw this before, so I apologize. So here's the sentence I had. All right. Yeah. Okay. I lost everybody. Having trouble here. Sorry, guys. Give me a second. All right. All right. Can everybody see my? I hit the ball. With my bat over the fence, can you all see that on your yes. screen? Okay, good. Yes. All right, good. So if we were to break up this sentence, we, we find the main sentence is I, subject, hit, that's the verb, the action, and then what did I hit? The ball, the object. All right? Now, these other phrases are modifying that phrase in some way. So, for example, this next, and we'll go through some more examples, but what we would have is something like this. All right, the, yeah. the phrase with my bat tells me how I hit the ball. And so it's modifying hit. And then uh -huh. over the fence tells me where I hit the ball. And again, modifying hit. All right, so yeah. we would connect these. If I were to preach this text, for example, right? I'd say the main, the main statement here, brothers, is I hit the ball. Now the question is this, how did I hit the ball? I hit the ball with my bat. A bat is a large wooden object that is used in the sport of baseball. And you know, I could go and talk about bats and illustrate bats for a while. And then my second point would be, where did I hit this ball? 
while I hit it over the fence. Now, what does that mean? What is the significance of hitting a ball over a fence? It means I scored a run, you know? So um, that would be the idea of how you break the, a structural diagram guides us into how the, the passage uh, outlines. So with this point, I'd have two points on regarding hitting the ball. How did I hit the ball? Where did I hit the ball? All right. So when we do a, a passage, if you will remember when we did, you had your passage in Ephesians a while back that you preached. And one of the steps in that process that I showed here at the beginning is mm -hmm. the structural diagram. All right. Mm -hmm. Now, for example, or let me just show it here. For example, in when we did the epistles, this step here, the poetic analysis wasn't there, all right? We went from the, the book study, looking at the book as a whole, the background and the literary context. We went right from there and we went into the passage and we diagrammed the passage that we're studying. And then we did textual observations, significant words, and we're gonna do that here in our narrative text as well. But when we added, sorry, this shouldn't be poetic, this should be, when we added the, the uh, narrative step, then we also did narrative analysis. And that's where we spent a number of weeks looking at narrative specific ways to study the passage. All right, but now that we've done that, we did the character analysis, the setting analysis, the scene analysis, the plot analysis. We looked at the story, summarized its point. Now we're gonna go back and look at pieces of the story and to fill in some of the gaps and the details, all right? And this is where structural diagramming can help us a little bit. So let's say, for example, we understand the point of the story overall, that um, it's this idea of Jesus overcoming the cultural prejudice and bias and bringing the gospel to these Samaritans as an example that showing us that he was sent to be savior of the world. And in addition to that, we are called by Christ to go into the world. And that's sort of the idea of the whole story. But as we looked at the story, there were certain parts of the story that, that needed some more understanding. For example, he talked about living water. What did he mean mm -hmm. by that? He talked about true worship. What was his point in that section? So those would be specific places within the story that we wanna examine a little more carefully in order to understand. And structural diagramming is one way we can begin to do that. Yes, Pastor Bobby. I understand now, Pastor Tim, it's clear now that uh, the context of structural diagramming is uh, for particular verses or passages. Significant, no? Significant verses and passages. Okay. Yeah. Because the structural diagramming uh, we did already in the narrative analysis. Okay, so here, what we're going into now is in the context of significant verses or passages in the narrative. Okay, I got it now. Yeah, I would say, I would break it down like this. Okay, epistles, um, you know, we would diagram diagram the whole passage all right let's okay. let's say you had you know ephesians 2 you know 1 to 10 that was your text you would diagram the whole passage because it is instructional um you want to see how all the phrases and sentences are connected together okay there's there's a logical flow of thought because it's in it's in the form of instruction, all right. Now, in okay. a poet in poetry, it's the same thing normally, particularly in the Psalms, uh, where you would diagram the whole poem, mm -hmm. all right. Because the poem is also instructional, um, but its instruction often comes in the form of imagery, and parallelism, and other things we're going to study. All right, but there's still the way, the way the instruction or doctrine is presented is how all of the phrases and, and clauses are linked together. 
all right? But they're just linked together and they're expressed in a more figurative way. Now, with narrative, narrative is a story where the doctrinal truth uh, is, not, is not found in every, every statement or description, right? When, when John was describing Jesus being tired and wanting a drink at the well of Jacob, there wasn't a whole doctrinal um, uh, statement in that. Jesus was simply tired, and he was thirsty, and he was sitting at a well, okay? Um, but the point of the story in John 4 it does have, there is a doctrinal or doctrinal truths being communicated to us. Um, the uh, Jesus as the Messiah, Jesus as the one sent as Savior of the world, uh, the fact we are sent in order to proclaim the gospel. The gospel is for all. I mean, those timeless truths that are connected to the story. Um, but that's, those are communicated as we understand the point of the narrative. But So you don't diagram every part of a narrative because it's not given like an epistle or a poem. All right? However, within the narrative, uh, there are often what I will call instructional parts, okay? Um, again, like I said, in John chapter 4, the examples of that are in verses 13 and 14, in verses 21 to 24, and then I think 34 to 38, if I remember right. Those are parts of that narrative where Jesus gives specific instruction about a particular topic, all right? It's not like a dialogue only, but he's actually communicating truth in that dialogue. And so that's where you would want to diagram because when it, because the, the nature of those parts of the story are instructional, a diagram will be helpful in, in revealing what, um, what the speaker, in this case, Jesus, meant in those cases. Okay? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Does that make sense? Yeah. So it's not... So it seems, yeah. Sometimes it's in doc, instructional... Uh, and doctrinal, and and at the same time insightful also. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So okay. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So I'm not talking about diagramming of the whole narrative or some. This is specifically the uh, as I showed you in the example here. Taking a sentence or some sentences and seeing how they are connected grammatically okay? okay diagramming is can be described as a a visual uh, representation of how each phrase or clause is connected grammatically mm -hmm. in the sentence and so that's why when you have a story where it says you know uh joe went to the store and met a man along the way. The man was wearing um, a nice barong, but uh, spilled his uh, uh, hot sauce on his barong. Now, I'm not going to diagram this. There's not doctrinal truth buried within these sentences. But if, if there was something like, and Joe told the man, God is sovereign. And he has allowed you to stain your shirt. Sometimes, you know, sometimes he tells us why he allows things to so now this the man's offering instruction you see what i mean so if this were a biblical text you know i might take this the dialogue portion and i might diagram this part because he's offering instruction all right mm. i'm not going to diagram all of this that's okay. just the story part and there won't be any value in doing that all right that, that's what i'm trying to to get across okay all right some people do, you know, and that's fine. There's, it's not bad or wrong to diagram everything. It's just I don't think there's as much value 
in diagramming the narrative portions. But there is much value in diagramming those parts of the narrative which are in the form of an, an instruction. Or for example, in, in prophetic texts, when the prophets are preaching, that's a sermon. That's instruction, that's commands, that's exhortations, that's the call to respond. That's definitely something you would diagram. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. And, and besides, Pastor Tim, as you mentioned, uh, narrative analysis previous to uh, structural diagramming, narrative analysis is a sort of diagramming already, right? I would say narrative analysis is just a, it's a way to, to look at the story, um, understanding how stories are, are used and how authors reveal their main points in the form of a story. And so narrative analysis is, sort, is a way to break down those different elements of the story, character, setting, plot, scenes, in yeah. order to uncover the way the author revealed the, his main doctrinal truths in the form of a story. So um, it's not really a diagramming per se, it's just a form of a type of analysis, uh, a type of study recognizing the specific genre of narrative. When we do poetry, we're gonna do the same kind of thing where we're gonna look at a poetic text understanding there are certain elements in poetry that are used imagery figurative language uh, parallelism figures of speech and so those are not things we would look at in the epistle normally uh, but we would look at it in poetry all right we don't use scene analysis when we study a, a poem or an epistle but we do for a story because that's one uh, um, way that a story communicates doctrinal truth is in the form of these scenes and the point of these scenes overall. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Let's keep going. And then um, if there's still uh, questions on that, let me know. Okay. So what I'd like to do, because we will, there are some places in this story in John four that we are going to uh, want to diagram. Uh, let's, Let's go back and review some of the uh, the diagramming, uh, the approach, the methodology, and the the techniques for doing that. Um, you can go back to your module one teacher's manual uh, for some specific details on this. But but basically, again, as I as I showed you in the example sentence, you know, I hit hit the ball with my bat over the fence all right so i what i want to do is to, to diagram this to to identify how these phrases relate to each other to give a visual representation of that i first need to recognize that each phrase or clause is separated by these what i call connector words all right so again the main sentence here is the main subject verb is i hit the ball but then we have these other phrases that are not part of the main sentence. They don't stand alone. They are linked to the sentence. So for example, if I just had a statement with my bat, is that a standalone sentence? If, if the phrase is just with my bat? No. No, there's no action. Yeah. There's no verb. What about with my bat? What do you mean? What? what or over the fence, same thing. They're, they're, not, they're dependent in the sense that they don't have any, they don't say anything yet. They're, but I hit the ball is an independent statement, isn't it? it? It has a subject, a verb, and an object. But these next two phrases are dependent. That is, they're dependent on something else in order to give meaning. So, and that something else is, as I showed you before, with my bat is describing how I hit the ball. And over the fence is describing where I hit the ball. And so that's why they both, I, I, I line them up underneath the verb hit because they're telling me something about that action. All right, and so I can look at this visually. 
here and I can now see in a sense how the grammar is, how, how these phrases are connected. The yellow statement is a sentence. That's the main sentence, the main phrase. That's the main point, if you will. If, if this were a sermon, I hit the ball would be the main point. The sub points would be how I hit the ball and where I hit the ball. And those sub points are expressed in these dependent phrases, okay? So the diagram is something that will visually show us what the main statements are and what the supporting statements are, and then how those are connected together, all right? It's a powerful tool to break down an instructional passage because it'll help us to see what the main parts are. Because you know what happens when, when guys preach They'll just take a short phrase or a word or something, and they'll make this whole big sermon on that. But, but that may not be what the author is emphasizing. So, for example, if I had this phrase here, I hit the ball with my bat over the fence. Brothers, let me tell you about bats. Oh, bats are so important in the life of baseball. And you make this whole sermon about bats. You know, the, the wooden bat, not the flying bat, right? And this whole sermon is about the importance of bats and the different kinds of bats you can use and, and why one bat's better than another bat. So he's made this whole topical sermon about bats, whereas the point of this passage, if you will, was that I hit the ball. That's what I wanted to emphasize, is I hit the ball. Now, one subpart is I hit it with my bat. But I didn't write this statement to emphasize about bats. All right, I wrote this statement to emphasize the fact that I hit the ball. You see the difference? And in mm -hmm. sermons though, how often do we have a sermon where some guy focuses on one little part of the verse and it may not even be something that the original author was, was making a, a point of, all right? At least not the major point, all right? So the diagram will help us see the priority of the author within the passage. What is it that he's giving primary attention to? And what is it that he's giving secondary attention to? All right? Is that, are there any thoughts or questions on that? Yeah. So diagramming helps us to identify the primary focus and the secondary focus, focuses. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Let me give you an example that we used in class, uh, the, the Great Commission, right? Remember where Jesus said, uh, I, uh, all, all authority has been given to me. Um, then he said, go therefore and make, here, let's squeeze this a little bit, and make disciples of all the nations. Right? You guys remember what comes next? Baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Uh, teaching them to observe all that, I commanded you. all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Okay, that's... Um, now, if I'm looking at this, and if I'm diagramming this, this is what's going to look like. All authority has been given to me. Um, go, therefore, and make disciples. Oops, what happened here? Of all the nations. And then how do I make disciples? Baptizing them, teaching them. And then the third, so after the diagram, you'll have basically three main statements by Jesus where he's describing this. Let me, um, this is just a quick, all right? So if I'm preaching this passage, I've got three main points. Jesus's authority, Jesus's commission, Jesus's promise. Okay, and all I'm doing is I've just identified the main sentences here. The main sentence is all authority has been given. All right, that's one main sentence that he has. 
The second main sentence is make disciples of all the nations. And the third is I'm with you always. And all the other, all the other statements or phrases are, are subordinate. They are supporting, but they're not the main. Because baptizing, that's, that's not a main verb. Teaching is not a main verb. And then all the others are phrases. So I see here I got three specific points Jesus is making. And then under the second point, make disciples, there's two ways that he says to make disciples. One is baptizing. That is essentially right. Evangelism, bringing them the gospel, and uh, which leads to them making a commitment and being baptized. And then the second is teaching them. That's how I make disciples, by baptizing, evangelism, by teaching, by um, giving them instruction and edification. All right? And so this, what the, and this comes as a result of the diagram. So the diagram guides me as far as how I preach this passage. But I don't know how many times I've heard sermons on this passage, and the only thing focused on is baptizing, because they call it it's evangelism or missions. All right, so they'll preach this passage, and it's all about evangelism. And and they've sort of yes, evangelism evangelism is a part of this. Missions is a part of this, but it's not the main emphasis. The main emphasis is there's three parts. Jesus has all authority. Jesus commissions us to make disciples, and Jesus promises he'll be with us always. Okay, those are the three main statements Jesus is making in the Great Commission. And then even within the Great Commission, Jesus' command, the second point, there's two ways that we make disciples. Not just one, not just evangelism, but also teaching of sanctification. All right? And so if we're not careful, we will latch on to one phrase or one sentence within the verse, in the passage, and make that the big emphasis when really that, that may not be the emphasis that the original author has, okay? So diagramming is a useful tool to, to show us what the main ideas within a given passage are, okay? Mm -hmm. Comments or questions? Main ideas, Pastor Tim, uh, regarding the significant portions, regarding the significant verses, right? Yeah. Yeah, and this is another example, the Great Commission here. That, that's a instruction Jesus gave within the flow of a narrative. Mm, All right? Yeah. So this is another example where we would diagram this part of the narrative because it's instruction that's being given uh, within it. So it will be very, very useful. Okay, so let's, let's remind ourselves there's three steps in this diagramming process to get us from the verse and then to see how, how these phrases are connected together, all right? And the first step is this is to identify the phrases or clauses from the connector words. So for example, in our example here, I hit the ball, there's a connector word. This second phrase is connected by the word with, okay? And this third phrase is connected by the word over. And then I could have added to this, and I scored the winning run okay so that if that word the connector word here is the word and and by the way in this statement then i'd have two main points i hit the ball i scored the winning run that's an so, independent sentence pardon the the that's a independent sentence yes this second is an independent sentence. Exactly. So it's connected by the word and. So the, I'm making two points here. Mm. I hit the ball, point number one. I scored the winning run, point number two. Those are the two points I'm emphasizing. With my bat and over the fence are sub points describing mm. or connected to I hit the ball. They're not the main points. Mm. All right. 
Pastor Tim, yes. should we consider it a matter of rule that uh, subordinate clauses always begins with prepositions? Not always. And that's, what, that, that's a good question. That segues, uh, takes us into this. When we identify phrases and clauses, uh, one way that we do that is prepositions. Okay, those are, are com very common connector words. So do you guys remember some pre English prepositions? Of the, of, of by, by in, in uh, with, over, through, through. at, Okay, right, uh, uh, um, uh, upon, under, there's a whole list of them. In fact, if you go uh, to, uh, and I'll put this in your notes, if you go just go to Wikipedia, list of English prepositions, you'll see a whole list there, okay? So I'll, I'll give you that link uh, when in the handout that I send to you later. So prepositions are a very common form of connector word, and in, in my sentence here, notice, these two phrases were the connector words are prepositions. But we also see another connector word, and that is given here, the word and. That's not a preposition. That's called a conjunction. Okay? So conjunctions are also very common connector words. So what, what are some conjunctions we have? But, uh, and, um, the Any others? Since. Kind of Since. Good. Yeah. Or, uh, therefore, uh. so that, uh, because, for, okay? These are if, conjunctions. If. Uh, if would be, uh, yeah, sort of, if then, that's a, that's a uh, conditional phrase, but that, that also uh, is a type Conjunction, and again, you can go to Wikipedia has a list of conjunctions, and I'll give you that link as well. All right, so uh, we have prepositions that are connector words and conjunctions. Those are by far the two most common. I would say, what, I don't know, 90% of phrases and clauses will have these connector words. Okay, so we look for those, because what we want to do at the beginning is identify each of the phrases in the passage. And we do that by identifying the connector words. There's another kind of connector word, and they're called relative pronouns. And those, there's only a few of them. Which, that, who, or whom. Okay, those are the most common. Again, you can go to Wikipedia. There's a, the list. It's given there. All right? So, for example, if you say, I hit the ball, which was green, or usually baseballs are white. So, so here, I hit the ball is the main sentence. Now, which was white doesn't stand alone. It's, it's a phrase, and what is it modifying? The ball. The ball, because it's telling us something about the ball. What kind of ball, okay? And it's connected by the connector word is which. Okay? So it's not telling us something about how I hit the ball. It's telling me something about the ball. All right? And again, it's subordinate. It's a prepositional phrase modifying ball. All right? So that's relative pronouns. Then we have a couple of more challenging ones. Uh, one is called, it's called a participle. Mm-hmm. Okay, we just saw these in participle. These are, you can think of them as like verbs that have an ing ending, okay? Now, not all ing words are participles, all right? So you have to keep that in mind, but many are. So for example, here in the Great Commission, there's, you see that there's a participle here and a participle here. Baptizing. Baptizing is the verb baptize with an ing ending. Mm -hmm. Teaching yeah. is the verb teach with ing ending. All right. Now, what is significant about these participles is, um, let me just, there's what's called a main verb. And I apologize, men, for we're having a little grammar lesson here. Uh, but yeah. we need to because, <laughs> because the, 
authors of scripture used grammar. Yeah. So if we're going to study scripture, we've got to deal with grammar. And uh, English grammar is not the easiest, uh, even for me. And I'm an English speaker. <laughs> so, um, but, so we need to talk a little bit about this. And again, these will all be in the notes that I uh, send you. And so if, if you have trouble following right now, just read through those notes and uh, hopefully that'll help. Pastor we Bobby? Pastor Tim, we appreciate the review on lessons on the English grammar, particularly diagramming. Because if you're having problems with English as an American, how much more for us? Yeah, I understand. And, and it's so important. I mean, you know, some of the best translations of the Bible in the world are in English. You know, obviously the best versions of the Bible are in Hebrew and Greek. But unfortunately, you know... Many of us have not been able to, to study that thoroughly enough to use the original language, so we rely on translation. And, yeah. um, you know, I, I'm not saying this is a boast or anything, but, but you know, I probably some of the best translations that exist now are in English. Uh, there's a good yeah. Syriac translation, but none of us speaks, none of us know Syriac. <laughs> there's, uh, you know, um, the, the Latin Vulgate's a decent translation, but you know, I don't know that any of us know Latin. So English is the best one we have access to right now. And so we need to understand English grammar because hopefully the translators have applied that the, the right rules of English grammar when they are interpreting Greek or Hebrew grammar. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that said, we need to know a little bit about English grammar. And, and this will help, I think, because it'll help what I was saying earlier. There's 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 a couple kinds of verbs you know there's the main verb and that is so for example i hit the ball let's just use this um and then swinging my bat okay i have two verbs in this sentence i hit and swinging okay now hit is a main verb but swinging is not it's a participle it's taking the verb swing and it's adding ing. Now, why does this matter? All right, for this reason. That that phrase, swinging my bat, how is that modifying? It's modifying the verb hit. How is it modifying the verb hit? What is it telling us? The, the manner. Yeah, how? Yeah. How I hit the ball, okay? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, a manner would be the sort of the formal way to say that. The manner in which I hit the ball. How I hit the ball. How did I hit it? Mm -hmm. Swinging my bat. Now, swinging my bat is not the main action. I hit the ball is the main action. Swinging my bat is the subordinate or supporting action. So what that means is this. The emphasis here is on hit, not swinging. Mm -hmm. And that's why I go back to our example in the Great Commission. If I look at just the second part here, go therefore and make disciples. Make disciples is the main verb. All right? Baptizing yeah. is a participle. It's not the main action. It's a supporting action. It's telling you how to make disciples. Teaching, not the main action. It's a supporting action. How do I know that? Because the author chose to use a participle, Jesus in this case. Now, if Jesus had said this, make disciples and baptize and teach, mm -hmm. guess what? Those are three equal actions now. Baptize and mm -hmm. teach are as important as make disciples mm -hmm. because of the grammar. Because he used the word and, and, and baptize and teach are main verbs now. Mm -hmm. But a participle is what's called a subordinate verb. That is, it's a verb that modifies, it modifies another verb usually. It's telling mm -hmm. us something about another verb. Mm -hmm. Okay? So in this sentence, 
because Jesus used the participle baptizing and the participle teaching, he's telling us that the main command is make disciples. Mm -hmm. yeah. All right? That's the command. Okay. Make disciples of all the nations. Mm -hmm. He's not saying make disciples one, baptize two, teach three. Those would be three separate commands if he worded it that way. But he didn't. He worded it this way in order to tell us the main command, brothers, is make disciples. The first way you do that is baptizing them. Mm -hmm. The second way is teaching. Okay? So these because baptizing and teaching are subordinate actions yeah. in this. They're modifying the main action, which is making disi make disciples. Pastor Bobby? Yeah. Uh, Pastor Tim, in the English construction, uh, as you pointed out, there's no conjunction, right? Rather, there, what we have is the comma. Yeah. You mean right here? Yeah. The punctuation uh, shows us that they are modifiers. Uh, yes. Yes, as you stated there is no conjunction uh, before the participles. So yeah. They're not... Sorry, go ahead. Yes, yes, that's, 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 that's my only point, Pastor Tim. Yeah, and so commas um, are ways that the translator will show us pauses in the sentence. Mm. And so uh, that's actually... A, one the, the the last type of um uh participles and then i had the end punctuation is another way to identify the different phrases oh, okay. that's and clauses true. all right so that's comma period mm -hmm. uh, colon etc but a punctuation keep in mind this is the interpretation this is a translator's interpretation because there's no punctuation in the original hebrew or greek all right. Um, so that's the translator's interpretation of. So when they read, uh, they're just following English grammar here. When they put these mm. commas in, um, that's 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 an English grammatical feature that is telling us there's a pause, there's a break here, but that's interpretive. Mm. But we don't really need the comma to tell us there's a break because we have the participle yeah okay but sometimes the punctuation will help us a little bit if we're stuck that's the beauty of the english language yeah that is one one nice feature is that the punctuation guides us um mm. is helpful okay and you know here's a freebie this is a bonus um when you're thinking about punctuation a, a comma is a um Intended pause, a semicolon is a longer pause, a period is a hard stop, mm -hmm. all right? Yeah. So if you see a comma, that's like a short pause. A semicolon is a, is a longer pause. It's not quite a period, but it's not a comma either. It's a stronger break. I can even put it that way. Um, I call it a slight break, stronger break, and then the period is a hard stop. And what I mean by that, a break is sort of this dividing up of the sentence where there's a, a small break here with the comma, but if it had been a semicolon, that's a harder break, meaning that the next phrase is more independent in some ways. So uh, just... Keep that in mind. It, don't worry too much about that. But any form of punctuation is a break in the sentence and can be used to help you identify phrases and clauses. Just recognize these are interpretive. There's no comma in Greek that's used in the original text. All right. The original text was just a block of capital letters. All across the page, no spaces, no commas, no periods, no quotations, nothing. Um, 
they were trying to conserve paper because it was expensive. So they would try to fill in as much as they could on, on the parchment. So they didn't use any form of punctuation. They didn't even separate the letters. Um, so punctuation is added by the translations. All right, just to help it be more readable and understandable for us. All right. Mm -hmm. But like I said, in this case, we don't really need the comma to tell us we have a new phrase because of these participles. And secondly, these participles are telling us that this phrase, this statement here, is subordinate to make disciples. Make disciples is the main command. Baptizing is how we make disciples. Teaching is how we make disciples. All right? But they're not the main command. They're telling us how we obey or carry out the main command. So when you preach, the emphasis is on making disciples. Mm. That's Jesus' main point. The supporting two points to that are baptizing and teaching. And then, like I said, if you look at this passage overall, let me move these to here. If you look at the Great Commission, Again, I want you to notice all authority has been given. That's a main verb. This is a, a main statement. This is the first main statement. The second one is this, and I, I don't have time now to, technically this phrase is literally therefore going. This is actually a participle. <laughs> um, so it's really just one verb here, make disciples. And then the third, So here, that's why I'm saying the three main points Jesus is making are all authority, make disciples, I'm with you always. Baptizing and teaching are not the main points. So when you preach this message or this text, the focus needs to be on the three main points. Now, obviously, Jesus spends the most time on the second one. So that, that will you'll spend more time on that portion of scripture when you're preaching through this, but I'm just saying that baptizing and teaching are subordinate to make disciples. Make disciples is the main command that Jesus was giving, and then the, the participles tell us they support that main command. Okay, questions? Okay. Pastor Tim? Yes. Are, uh, Sometimes, am I right that sometimes the participles are not so obvious? Our participles are not always in the ING. A uh, classical example here in Matthew, Matthew 28, the go therefore. In yes. the English, it's not in the ING until yeah. you put out there in the parentheses yeah and this this i i got because um i found if you go to the original greek so i um maybe we'll do this i don't know if we'll do it to this morning maybe next time um time. interlinears are a very helpful tool for mm -hmm. us in this process and they'll be very helpful when we do poetry by the way as well because sometimes the translators don't translate a participle as a participle. <laughs> and that has actually <laughs> happened here. This mm -hmm. verb go, it's translated like a main verb, isn't it? Go, yeah. that's a main verb, it's a yeah. command. But actually, Jesus used a participle, going. The idea is, as you are going, make disciples of all the nations. So it really is sort of a third way we make disciples. Because again, it's a participle. Yeah. One you showed us, Bible Hub. Yes, I use Bible Hub. Uh, here, I, you want me to show you guys now? Yeah, perhaps. Would it be helpful? That's very helpful. The one you showed, the, when you showed us Bible Hub, very helpful. The, okay. The, 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 it's very helpful. 
let me do that real quick for this since we're talking about it. Um, let me pull up my internet. Okay, so let me share share my internet screen here. Okay. All right, so let's go to biblehub.com. It's a really good resource. We're going to use it for word studies later. All right, and my passage is Matthew 28, verse 28. All right, take me a minute to get there. Matthew 28. And then verse 18. All right. And then notice. Uh-oh. Sorry about this. Matthew 28. All right. 28. <laughs> I'll try again. And then we're going to go to verse 18. 28, 18. Now, once I've got my passage, then I go to, you see where it says interlin here? Yeah, interlinear. Interlin. That's for interlinear. See that? So I'm going to hit that. All right, here we go. Some here's some Greek. Yeah. Woo! All right. That's what we're here for. Greek. New Testament Greek. <laughs> I love it. Now notice, um, and I'll go to the next verse. It's got our what we're interested in. Arrow for the next verse. You could click here for the whole chapter. So you give the whole chapter an interlinear. Um mm -hmm. I'm waiting for got a lot of people using our internet here all right well here's verse 19 now notice a couple things here on the interlinear in the middle is the actual greek text okay you see that the greek letters there as i'm scanning across um so those are the that's the actual greek text and then below it right below in the red here is um the literal definition from this interlinear. That's just the dictionary definition, all right? And then above that is an English transliteration, meaning uh, if you wanna try to pronounce this word, here's sort of an English, uh, you can pronounce it with these English letters. So, poruthentes. And actually the accent's here, so you'd say <coughs> poruthentes. All right. Above that's the Strong's number. That's what's going to give us all the information about the work for our word studies later. But then at the bottom here, can you guys see that? They're in that box there. Can you guys see that? Mm -hmm. It says verb. That's what the V stands for. Mm -hmm. And then it has aorist, participle, passive, nominative, mm -hmm. masculine, and plural. Now, we don't have to worry about all the other stuff. But what is helpful is notice it says participle. Do you see that? Yeah. It's a participle. It's a participle. And they translate it having gone or going. All right? You don't have to worry about the fact it's aorist or passive right now. But what is helpful and what I recommend you do, especially when you're studying you know, diagrams or epistles, is actually look at the interlinear because there's a couple things you're going to notice here. One is this, that, oh, this is not a command. This is a participle. He didn't say go. He's saying going or having gone. <coughs> Therefore, all right? Mm -hmm. Now, why the English translations put go is because um, that was sort of, a, of a, an expression that you see a lot in the New Testament. It'd be kind of like if I were to tell you, uh, please go and get that Bible for me. Now, the main instruction is get the Bible. 
But to do that, I'm asking you, go, go over there and get the Bible. Mm -hmm. So it kind of, I think that's a more common way to say it in English. You wouldn't say, as you're going, get the Bible. You would say, mm -hmm. go and get the Bible. Mm -hmm. So I think they're trying to express the idea as we would express it in English. But technically speaking, it is mm -hmm. a participle. All right, so that's one thing. The interlinear will tell us, do I have a, a regular verb, a finite verb, or a participle? And the other mm. thing that's interesting here is notice uh, in the English that it's translated make disciples. So mm. the verb is make, disciples is the object. What am I making? Disciples. But in mm. this case, actually the verb is, is the, from the word disciple. Yeah. All right. Mathetes is the noun for disciple. Here's, here's Mathetusa. Sate, you know. It's the, and so notice here, it's the verb and it's an imperative. So this is the command. So it's really make disciples is the verb. Even though in English, make is a verb and disciple is a noun. But the Greek tells us, no, actually, it's, it's really both the verb. It's make disciples. That's a verb in the Greek. Yeah. You following me? Yeah. Yeah. Even if you're not, just say you are, all right? Makes me feel good as a teacher. <laughs> Pastor Tim, <laughs> yeah. the English language is trying to keep true to its principles of language. No? Yes. Yeah. But, but if we just look at it in the literal sense, that's really how it would read. You know? That's why it's very important to go to the interlinear. The literal is therefore disciple. Okay. Mm. Well, it's it's therefore uh, the idea is make disciples. So it's not yeah. not saying disciple in the sense that we would use it, but um, it is this idea of of I don't know a good way to express it. Um, it's like us Filipinos, Pastor Tim, with, with our broken English. That's why we call it broken English. <laughs> Sometimes there is no, there is no uh, conjunction, no preposition, no. That's like the Greek also. So yeah, we're so, like the Greeks, pala. <laughs> Disciples. <laughs> yeah, I mean that's a that's a good point. This is a good example of you know going from one language to another, and and you men understand this much better than I do because you speak more than one language very well. And so you understand in trying to express an idea from one language to the next, it's not easy. And so yeah. often in translations, you know, we just see an attempt by the translators to, to try to make it, take what was written That's in another language. Possible. And What's that? Uh, I think they're trying their best to make it as close as possible to the original. They are, while trying to help an English speaker, in this case, understand what the Greek is saying. So make disciples yeah. is actually a, a pretty good translation, even though technically it's make is the verb and disciple is the noun, whereas in the Greek, it's actually all a verb. But, mm -hmm. but the English is trying to communicate the concept. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So... Uh, it is helpful when you diagram um, to after you've done your do your diagram in in the translation just do the don't worry about an interlinear yet because you'll do that later all right you'll you'll use that as a check later okay. and Selmo did yeah. you have a question my question sir is the translator the translator make a word make actually the literal literal word we found in the scripture from the original is disciple yeah it it add, yeah this you mean this interlinear here yes the interlinear sir having gone there for disciple the word make is missing there only the translator that translator place uh, make in order to have a grammar yeah yeah exactly um this would be disciple in the sense as an action but 
but it really isn't. He's not saying disciple all the nations like we use the word disciple. Um, because when I use the word disciple, like, you know, I disciple my brother. That presumes my brother is a Christian. But see, Jesus was saying, make disciples. And to do that, you first need to bring them to Christ. That's why he said baptizing. Mm. So you couldn't say disciple here. That would, at least in the English usage, would focus more on the teaching them to observe. That's what we would call discipleship. Mm. But Jesus wasn't saying that exactly. He was saying, you know, make disciples. Um, and how you do that is evangelism, bring them to Christ, you know, uh, as expressed by baptism. And then secondly, teaching them to observe. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, so I like that the English uh, translation exactly. added the idea of make, because that's really, I think, what Jesus is communicating here. It's very clear. It's very clear. Yeah. But yeah, that's a good, that's a good observation, Anselmo, that notice here in this particular translation, from the interlinear people, uh, they just put disciple. Um, but, uh, but it's not as clear because one, this is a verb, all right? So usually disciple is the noun form. Uh, mathetes would be the Greek word, the noun for that. But this is a verb, mathetuo, uh, which is, uh, the verbal form of this idea of disciples. So it has the, it's, it has the idea of a making disciples, b b causing one to become a disciple. Might be a better way to, to say it. All right. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, I, I, I use interlinear and we'll, we'll, we might bring that step in later when we're uh, going, doing our diagram. Let's try to cover a little more ground on the diagramming here. So, Again, I, just in making my point is the baptizing and teaching are participles and therefore they are not main verbs. They modify a main verb. All right. That's, the, that's why I have them indented here under make disciples. Okay. So going back to our steps here. One, we identify phrases and clauses. How do we do that? We want to take a verse and we break it up into its phrases and clauses. And we do that by finding and noticing the connector words. Um, the most common connector words are prepositions and conjunctions. But we also have relative pronouns that can function as a connector word, participles. And then if we are, sometimes punctuation can be helpful. All right. Mm -hmm. So that's the first step. The second step then is to ask ourselves the question, what does this phrase modify? And how does it modify? So let's go back to our original sentence. I hit the ball with my bat over the fence. All right, now let's look. Where are the connector words here? With. With, that's a preposition. Over. And then over. <laughs> oh, wow. so, so there's my phrases, all right? And next is, okay. What does the phrase modify and how? The well, verb. it's on this one. It's modifying how I hit the ball. And this one's modifying where. OK, so you can kind of think of it like this. There's two kinds of phrases or clauses. One is. Uh, uh, let me see how to write this. Two types of phrases, clauses, all right? One type modifies a verb. Those are called adverbial, sorry, more grammar. The other type modifies a noun. Now, how do we figure out which is which? Well, if a phrase modifies a verb, it's going to answer the following questions. How, why, where, when, um, result. Okay. So if you have a phrase that answers one of those questions, so for example, over the fence, that's a location. That's telling us where. So then I know that it's going to modify a verb. It's telling me where an action takes place. Hit. All right. And then with my bat, that carries the idea of how something was done. 
That word with is often has the idea of how. So that's going to tell me how I hit the ball. Yeah. All right. Now, if I'd said I hit the ball with my bat over the fence um, um, in the ninth inning. All right. That word in is a preposition would we'll separate that. Now, what was this modifying? What question, kind of question does it answer in the ninth inning? Any ideas? When? That's a when. When did this happen? When did I hit the ball? So again, it's modifying the action. If I put it under hit. See that? Because phrases that answer the question how or why or where or when or it may present a result, those will modify the action. That's why I put it under the verb hit. Now to modify a noun, that'll answer the questions of which one, uh, what kind, who, how many. All right, and that's why when I had I hit the ball, uh, which was white. Now that this isn't answering a how or when or a where or anything like that. It's answering what kind. It's describing something. And in this case, it's describing the ball. So I put it like this. See that? Mm -hmm. So that phrase is modifying ball. So I put it under ball. These three phrases are modifying hit because they're telling me something about the action. Mm -hmm. All right. So under this step, as I look at these phrases that I've identified, I then ask, how do they identify? And what do they identify? And then the third step is then I simply put, I put these all in a visual. So in this case, in this step, I would simply do this. All these phrases, I, I won't have them indented yet. I will just have them like this. I'll separate the phrases out and then I'll say, what kind of question, what question do these answer? And then in the third step, I actually indent under the appropriate word that they're modifying. Okay, so let's do this for a, for a well-known passage. John 3, 16, okay? Yeah. And uh, this is the New American Standard Translation. All right, so I'm gonna get some help from you guys. I'm gonna ask you to find the connector words for so we can identify each phrase and clause. So we're gonna start with you, Pastor Allen, and we're gonna look at see here all right you tell me where the first connector word is that breaks off the phrase that there you go and notice you had a little help there's a comma there too <laughs> so yeah <laughs> but yeah the word that that's a connector word all right that's garzon you want to try the next one where where does the next phrase begin Find the connector word. That he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him. Whoever. Okay, whoever, or even before, we have the word that again, don't we? You see that? Yes. All right, so now who, it's not whom or who, it's whoever. This actually is the subject of the verb here. So that one we wouldn't have a break it at. Whoever believes in him shall not perish. But have it. Pastor Bobby, where would the next break be? But. Yeah, but. And notice, guys, you had a little help from the translators here, <laughs> the commas. <laughs> All right? I don't rely on those as my first check. I try to look for connector words first. But in this case, the translators agree with us. They see it breaks at those two places, all right? Mm -hmm. All right, so that's that's it. I've just divided it into, and then the next is, okay, how? So let me take these phrases. All right, now what I'm gonna do is try to answer what 
uh, what questions do these, so, so this first one is, I'll call this, this is my main sentence, right? It has the subject, God, verb, so loved, and the world is the object, okay? Now, what is this second phrase? What do you think, what kind of question is it answering? What do you guys think? How? How? How what? How he loved us. How he loved Very good. How he loved the world. Excellent. All right, here, let me just shrink this a little. Okay. How he loved the world. All right. And then how about this next one? Whoever believes in him shall not perish. There's a that here. This is a little tougher. What, what kind of question do you think this might answer? What might it be modifying? And let, let me help you out here a little bit. They really should have included the word so. So that whoever believes in him. Is that a result? Yeah. Result or uh, or reason Mason, or that purpose. he gave. Yeah, purpose. All right. So the purpose that he gave or reason that he gave is that whoever believes in him would not perish. Okay. And then this also would be a reason because it's connected by the conjunction. All right. Now, sometimes you may not be able to answer that question. All right. I'm not sure what this is. That's okay. What, we, what we'll do, you just take a guess at it initially. And then we'll take this. And now we'll, we'll list it out. So... For God so loved the world, and now what I like to do is underline my verbs, how he loved the world, all right? So that's going to, this is going to be under loved, because it's modifying loved, how he loved, okay? All right, and then the next phrase, so that, and I put it under gave. Okay, again, I'm going to have to reduce this to, say, 20. All right, takes a little bit of uh, effort to get it fixed, right? There's a Bible software online called Bible Arc that um, some of the guys in Taya like to use um, that makes this go a little faster. Okay, and then what I do with this phrase, it's a second reason. So how would I, I note that here? And usually I'll separate my conjunction's like this. I separate it out, so I'll put the put it like this. And then, but have eternal life. It's contrasting shall not perish. He shall not perish, but shall have eternal life. All right, so that's what my diagram is going to look like. Now, notice here, what is the main idea? See that? God loved the, so loved the world. How did he love the world? He gave his only begotten son. And the reason for that was so that whoever believes in him would not perish, one, two, that they would have eternal life. Okay, so this, if you're to outline your sermon, God's love. 
how he loved us and um, the reason. Something like that. Okay. Okay. That's the idea here. So what, what I think I'd like to do is this, is we're going to take, um, well, well, we'll do this. Let's see how far we can get in the next 10 minutes or so. With I'm going to take two verses from John 4. And they're the two verses where Jesus talks about this living water. All right. And because, again, it's instructional, so I identify this as this is something I'd like to diagram. All right, to sort of break down this instruction, this this um, teaching that Jesus <coughs> is giving. All right, so here's my verse. All right, now what I'm going to do is uh, I need to first identify the phrases and clauses. Now, I'm going to separate out. The quotation. So I'm not going to diagram the, the first part here. Oh, nuts. Okay. All right. Jesus answered. I'll just do this. And said. Okay. But what we're interested in is what he said. Everyone... Okay, now we're going to go back to, let's see, Pastor Bobby, where do I, where's a connector word? Where would a, and starting from his quotation, mm -hmm. let me even just put it down here a little. Where's the first connector word that you see that I should break it at? Uh, everyone. I'm looking for prepositions. Yeah. Conjunctions, personal pronouns, participles, and then everyone. okay. So everyone. Uh, so where do you see the first connector word? A connector word. Yeah. Uh, first. But the, is the first connector. Okay, we have a but here. Verse fourteen. Yeah. Now notice there is that who. Relative pronoun. Mm -hmm. Kind of snuck in there. Mm -hmm. All right. So that this one actually is who is a connector word. Now drinks of, here's where English is not so helpful. I, you'd say, oh, wait, there's an of there. That's a connector word. Well, it's this is part of the verb. <laughs> it should say drinks this water. But unfortunately, um, English. But other than that, uh, yes, who is where we would break it first, because who is a relative pronoun. Remember our list back up here. Relative pronoun. All right. We had relative pronouns. Okay. So who is one of those? All right. So that's the first connector word that we came across. The next connector word is but. Good. It's a conjunction. And then also, too, we have a little help from the translator on that one. All right, Brother Arn. Can you show me where's the next connector word that I will break? Yeah. You need to take off your mute, by the way. Punctuation. You're still muted, Brother Arn. Pastor Tim. Yeah. He surrendered. He gave up. He surrendered? <laughs> <laughs> If you surrender, you have to, you have to hold up. A, you have to do this. White flag. <laughs> I surrender. <laughs> um, Anselmo, you want to try? 
You see where the next connector word is? We'll try, sir, right after uh, semicolon, but. Okay, so good. We know that's, that's a break there because we have the word but, which is a conjunction, and we also have a little help with the semicolon. There's one word before that, though, the word that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? That's a connector that's word. That. So keep that in mind. But the water... All right, Pastor Michael, where's the next connector word here? Starting, but the water that I will give him. That also. Yes. Okay. Water that I will give him will become, uh, Pastor Noor, where's the next connector word? Starting with, that I will give him will become in him a well of water. Where do we see the next connector word? Of. Okay, we have of, good. And then there's actually one little word that snuck in there, in. In. In him a well of spring of water. And then notice here, springing. We have a participle. Oh. Springing up to eternal life. Okay? So, in this step, We've identified the phrases from the connector word. So this connector word is the relative pronoun who. Then we have the conjunction but. And then a, another, um, this is, a, this functions like a relative pronoun that, another conjunction but, relative pronoun that, in him a preposition, of a preposition, and then springing a participle. So we have a variety of connector words here. Now, what you're gonna have to do is to to do yeah uh, spring up to there yeah mm -hmm. but you can have that two is can be a, a a preposition or it can be a completion of the verbal idea <laughs> so okay. again english gets a little bit complicated and and uh, we can do it for now like this but springing up doesn't stand by itself okay. springing up is the verb and so to eternal springing up to mm. is the verbal idea here springing eternal up. life is the object okay. what i'd recommend men is this um this week um and look on the handout i'll send out to you and really look at the at the lists of the connector words, because you need to get familiar with these. All right, mm -hmm. so look up the list of prepositions, of conjunctions, of relative pronouns. All right, you need to become familiar with these so that when you go through and you see the words that, or but, or in, of, you know, over, through, with, um, about, and therefore, you know, all these are connector words and you need to be able to see them so you can identify each phrase, okay? Because then you'll identify, okay, how, how do these phrase, what does it modify and how does it modify, all right? And so what I'm gonna do is encourage you to uh, look those up, look up those lists and if you're able to print them out or copy them so you can have them with you, and as you look at a text, just kind of look through and see if you can identify those connector words, all right? And then when you do, just like I did, you break, you break the sentence here. So that I will give him, uh, that I will give him, you know, in him a well. So these are all phrases that we're gonna next, uh, next week see how they connect together, all right? But I wanna stop here, because we've covered a lot of information, and I'm sure a lot of you have nosebleed right now, because we've done English grammar for so long. So you're ready for, uh, to be done, all right, with this. Uh, but I would encourage you, look at the list of connector words, and then see if you can do the next two steps. What does the phrase modify? So take this, the list here that we came up with of the different phrases and see if you can figure out what does it modify and how.
All right, and then next week we'll pick this up. We'll go through this passage, diagram it, and then maybe we'll diagram the uh, one other passage on the, the where Jesus talks about true worship. All right, and just practice that a little bit. And then we'll go to the next step of the textual observation and then word study and things like that. All right. And I, I think I want to go through this step, uh, this diagramming again, because it's so important for epistles. All right. Yeah. If you really want to study an epistle well, you really you have to diagram. That's the most important step for narrative analysis or for narratives. The narrative analysis step is the most important. All right. It'll give us the most insight into the narrative for epistles. It's the diagramming step. All right. So. I could have skipped this for narratives, you know, and just gone on, but I, I thought I would take opportunity to sort of go back, review this a little bit, because it will help you with the epistles, all right? And it is useful for some parts of narratives, okay? It's narrative also, Pastor Tim, very helpful. Yeah, because if you're teaching John 4 and these, these two parts, or what did Jesus mean by this living water? What was he meaning by his true worship? What was he saying here? The diagramming will help you break it down and understand how each of those phrases are connected together so you can have insight. And yeah. like I said before, man, uh, you know, if I were in teaching John 4, if you were going through the book of John, I would teach John 4, the whole story first, and what's the point of the story. And then I would take a week or two and come back to, like, for example, true worship. Mm -hmm. And... So I wouldn't try to cram true worship, that whole discussion, in the first sermon on John 4. I'd want to first teach the story. What's the point of the story? How do we see that in the story? And then next week, I'd say, now, now this week, I want to go back to what that story of the woman at the well. And, and I might review the key point of the story. And, and in that story, Jesus said some very important words about worship. And so I want to take some time this week and really understand what jesus tells us about worship all right mm -hmm. what that means and the importance of it and how we do it so so that that's how i would do that so so week one i would teach the story of john four and week two i might give instruction on true worship and we might do a series on true worship you know depending on the needs of your congregation because that part of the story is so important and rich. But if you try to teach that and teach the story, that's going to be too much. Okay? So I would teach the story first. Help them see the point of the story. How the story fits in the narrative of John. How it applies to them. And then the next week, come back to and dig deeper into the, you know, this section on true worship. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's how I would approach if I'm teaching through the book of John, all right? And I would do that in a lot of places in John where teach the story, and then there may be parts within the story that's, that has a lot of rich doctrinal truth that you would come back to uh, sort of as a second or third part of the sermon, okay? Pastor Tim. Yeah, Pastor can, Allen. Can, can we take that as a general rule for all of the narratives? of the bible getting first the point and then after getting the point of the whole story then you go to the instructional parts of it and deal with those instructional parts one by one i mean if you're doing a series yeah i would say if you're going through the book one by one. yeah if you're just like, if I'm a visiting pastor at a church uh, somewhere and the pastor there asks me, can you preach a message on, um, you know, on uh, mission, being a missionary or on our mission or evangelism or something like that, then I might, I would just preach the story of John 4. Mm -hmm. uh, because that, the whole focus there is we, you know, we need to be proclaiming the gospel to all, to all the nations. Um, mm -hmm. But if I were teaching and going through the Gospel of John in my church, uh, I would teach the story first. And then if there were some doctrinal truths within the story that I felt would be important for my congregation, I would stop and 
and do that. You know, if, like for example, when you get to John six and he's talking about the bread of life and and all of that, you first want to teach the story there, but then you might want to come back the next week and talk about the bread of life because some people some uh, churches believe that or the Catholics believe, you know, eat my flesh and drink my blood. They believe that the that it's literal, right? Transubstantiation. Uh, so maybe in your church, there's a lot of people from a Catholic background and they've heard this story many times and they've heard when Jesus said, eat my flesh and drink my blood. Ah, that means that when we take communion, it's the literal flesh and blood of Jesus. And so if I know that about my congregation, then I'm going to, you know what? I'm not going to try to cram that into when I teach the story of John 6, because again, it would be too much. But I'll teach the yeah. story first, and then I'll come back and say, you know, last week we, we looked at the uh, sermon on Jesus, or the, the story about Jesus said he's the bread of life, and the importance of recognizing he's the source of eternal life. But you know, there was one part in that story that I think would be helpful this week to talk about and that's when jesus talked about saying you know eat my flesh and drink my blood uh, and then you can spend a whole sermon and maybe end up being a little topical but focused on what did he mean when he said that in the context you can you know so it just depends or maybe you're going through a text that was talking about you know where jesus uh, delivered somebody from a demon and maybe the point of the story like in uh Oh, I can't remember the chapter, Luke, where Jesus delivers the man from the demons in order to show Jesus has authority over demons. That's the point of the story. But maybe your congregation, it would be helpful to do a short series on on demons there because maybe this they don't know much about demons. And so you might decide as the pastor that it'd be helpful to talk about this subject of demons and what do we learn about demons here in this text? And then, um, so it's a long answer to a short question, but, but I think uh, there's no rule on this. This is just Tim, Tim's approach to narratives. I think you want to teach the story, but we also recognize there's, there's many doctrinal truths that we find within stories that, that would be helpful to, to our people at times, but you have to be careful because one, you could get caught up and just go looking at every little thing in the story and you could have a 20 week series on one story and you'll never get through the book. The other thing to watch out for is, is if you try to capture, you know, preach the story like you would an epistle, um, then the people will lose this idea of, you know, how, you know, what is the story teaching me? Not just what these, one or two sentences are teaching me in the story. Okay. Any does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Very clear. So yeah. Again, it's not a rule. It's not a command in how we teach narratives, but it's just my suggestion to consider uh, when you are doing it. We want people to read narratives um, rightly, and so how we teach a narrative, we're teaching them how to read the Bible through that so if we teach them to look for the the point of the story rather than looking for all these doctrines within the story for example someone you know in the john 4 uh when it said jesus was tired you know a guy might go off and make a whole sermon about the humanity of jesus right jesus as a man he was a man right right and he would get tired right and he would get thirsty but is that what John is teaching us? Is he intending to teach us there in that passage about the humanity of Christ as the focus? I would say no, except in the idea of that he's the Messiah. Um, but, you know, some people will make a whole sermon about that one statement. And it is true. Jesus is, was man, you know, God and man. But we want to be careful we don't overemphasize doctrines within the story so that then the point of the story gets lost. So that, that's my point. The theology of tiredness. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, we covered, covered a lot. Again, uh, I know grammar is difficult, but it is, 
it is important. Uh, oh God! All right, you, so we're going to spend a little time next week again on diagramming and and then textual observation. So we're going to do a little bit more grammar, but like I said, it it, it will also help you when you're doing epistles. And it'll help for poetry uh, as well, because again, grammar is used to communicate. Every language has a form of grammar. So we need to understand the grammar if we're going to understand what's being said. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me ask uh, Pastor Bobby, uh, can you pray for our brother's birthday, our birthday boy, Anselmo, and, uh, and then close us uh, in prayer as well? Thank you for selecting me, Pastor Tim. Let's pray. 